Welcome to today's webinar, Residential Wood Construction FAQs, Wouldn't You Like to Know 2. It's an updated to a previous webinar. My name is Marcy Weber, and I will be the education team moderator for today's, today's presentation. Today's webinar is going to run 1.5 hours. Today's speaker is our Midwest Regional Manager, Ed Lisinski. This presentation is copyrighted. And today's presenter and production team, here's Ed Lezinski and our Director of Educational Outreach and our ed engineering moderator for today is Lori Cook. And then myself, Manager of Education and Accreditation and our Education Administrator, Kim Paulson. And now let's go over to the presentation. Good morning, uh, my name is Ed Lisinski. I'm the Midwest Regional Manager for the American Wood Council and I'd like to welcome you to Residential Wood Construction FAQs, also known as Wouldn't You Like to Know Too. This is our, our second time doing a, a similar uh, presentation to this. Uh, so we've updated this with the 2021 codes and with a few new uh, frequently asked questions that we've run into. So this is Wouldn't You Like to Know Part Two. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this class is uh, it does qualify for AIA credits, so uh, if you are an AIA member, you are eligible for some credits for this class. Please note this webinar and associated slides should not be used as a substitute for competent engineering support and expertise. Additionally, the webinar is being recorded, and by remaining a participant, you automatically consent to such recordings. If you do not consent to being recorded, please disconnect from the session. Here's the course description. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this class was taken uh, from some frequently asked questions that we've run into. Uh, this class actually originally started as a class called Cornucopia of Classic Connection Conundrums and was then expanded to the Fasteners and the Furious. So if you've seen some of those presentations in the past, uh, uh, we've we've expanded upon those. We've we've added a lot of new content. We've updated them to the new codes, and um, and now we have this uh, uh, additional presentation here for you. So hopefully you enjoy. Here's the learning objectives on the on the screen. I won't read through those, but um, uh, we'll we'll get uh, into each of these different objectives as we go. And here's our basic outline. Uh, we're going to go through residential wood decks. Uh, some fastener information, some detailing considerations, and then just some of those general or odd topics that you might come across. Um, not, not very often, but uh, but once you do come across them, you may have questions on them. So we'll, we'll give you some resources for those. But we'll start off with wood decks. So one of the main questions, one of the first questions that you get is just, what are my options for designing a deck in the IRC? And so you have three options. Uh, you have using IRC 507 for exterior decks, which is a prescriptive guide uh, that's that's in the IRC. You have the IRC, uh, you can use section 104.11, uh, which is the alternative materials uh, design and methods of construction and equipment. What that allows you to do is, is then take um, alternative design uh, criteria and use that as a, as a way to, to design your deck. One of, uh, one of the main uh, uh, alternative methods out there is the DCA-6 guide, which is a document that American Wood Council uh, produces. And uh, we're actually going to uh, focus in on that quite a bit throughout the deck portion here, just because it is our publication, so we do get a lot of, uh, a lot of questions on that. And then the third option is uh, using just a, a regular engineered design through IRC 301.1.3. So we'll start off with a few questions on the, on the DCA-6 guide right away. One of the ones that we run into often is, is why does, in table two, why does the overhang span sometimes increase as the joist spacing increases? So for this table, a uniform load on the joist typically does not determine the allowable span of the overhang. The length of the overhang is determined only by the deflection uh, due to a single point load or the limit of one quarter of the length of the main span. 
So under a single point load, the deflection at the overhang decreases as the main span decreases. And we need to control that deflection. Therefore, many cases, uh, for many cases in the table, allowable overhang spans are shorter because the allowable main spans are longer. To say it another way, the longer the main span that you have, the more deflection you're going to have on that overhang by, with a single point load, and therefore it needs to be shorter. Where it appears that the overhang spans are inconsistent with the joist spacing, the increased deflection of the overhang is controlling. Where the overhang deflection does not control, the overhang spans are limited to one quarter of the main span, and then they'll appear consistent with the joist spacing. Another common question is why is there a discrepancy between the allowable beam spans in the IRC and the DCA6, which is consistently three inches less than the IRC? The, distant, the difference between them comes from the, the definition of span used in both the IRC and the DCA6. The IRC tabulates the span based off of center of bearing to center of bearing per engineered design. The DCA6 tabulates the span based on clear span which is commonly used by builders or homeowners when they're putting together the deck. The clear span was estimated based on the engineering span minus three inches for the assumed minimum bearing. And here's a visual uh, of, of the difference between them. So the top part is, is figure R507.5 uh, from the IRC. And you can see that the span is measured from the center point of the bearing uh, to the center point of the bearing. The bottom is figure three from DCA six, and there the span, the span is the clear span from the face of the support to the face of support. The difference between these two definitions of span depends on the post size, but it's assumed to be three inches. So whenever you are using any sort of beam span, joist span, anything like that, make sure that you're aware of what actual span is being used by that table. Can I use four by four posts in the in the DCA six? Well, the commentary of the DCA six now gives an al gives alternative provisions, uh, such as using four by four post heights. Uh, the table is read the same way as the table in the main document. Does the DCA six have provisions for al alternate soil conditions? Another example of a alternative provision that's found in the in the uh, commentary of the DCA-6 is the soil bearing capacity. The standard tables used in the DCA-6 are based off of 1500 PSF soil. The commentary can help by providing alternative footing sizes based upon higher soil bearing capacities. How do you design a beam with joist framing in from both sides using the DCA-6? When designing a deck using the DCA-6, beams are only permitted to have joists framing in from one side. That's because the tributary area assumed in Table 3A is based on one side of the beam being loaded. The commentary can give guidance on how to design a beam with joists coming in from both sides by assuming larger spans. For example, let's assume there's eight foot joists framing into each side of a beam as shown in this figure. In Table 3, there's an eight foot joist span, or in table three, if there is, if this is an eight foot joist span, this is assuming only loading from one side. Therefore, doubling the spans would provide the correct tributary area for that beam. In other words, it would be 16 feet instead of the eight feet uh, to double the tributary area. This and other tips can be found in the commentary. Question we get asked often is, can I notch a four by four guard post uh, using the DCA six? And, and no, you cannot. Uh, the guard posts are required to be full depth and attached with two through bolts into the beam or joist. The attachment of the guard to the deck is a critical connection for any deck. Extensive research has been done on this connection to make sure that the occupants will be safe when they lean or fall into a guard. So you really don't want to compromise that, that connection of the post uh, holding up a guard. Another question that we get often is what, what's the height of a guard along built-in seating? Now the DCA-6 has the requirement that guards must be 36 inches in height measured from the adjacent surface. 
In contrast, the 2021 IRC has relaxed this requirement so that the 36 inch guard height is measured from the walking surface. There is a difference between the two where attached seating is connected to the guards. The DCA6 maintains at the 36 inches, maintains the 36 inches to prevent falling from the seats and is considered a best practice. Some people may argue that a built-in bench like this is not a walking surface, but anyone with young kids who love to climb on things may certainly disagree. If my deck has a roof, should the wet service factor be applied in design? Well, the DCA6 assumes the wet service factor in all designs and span tables. If your deck is going to be exposed to moisture for an extended period, period of time, the wet service factor should be applied. But again, if you're using the DCA6, you don't have to worry about that because that is already factored in. Why does the DCA6 prohibit attachment of the ledger to an overhang or a bay window? Um, this also, uh, we're also preventing uh, attachment to any sort of cantilever, like a brick, brick ledge cantilever or cantilevers to accommodate exterior insulation as well. So any cantilever of the house floor structure over a bearing wall in which the house band joist or rim joist does not have full bearing support would qualify as a cantilever per DCA6. In such cases, a non-ledger deck or engineered evalu evaluation would be required. For the house rim joist has full bearing support of a wall or foundation, such as shown in figure 14 of the DCA6, the vertical load path is continuous, consistent with the design, and consistent with the design assumptions in DCA6. The cantilever extent or extended joists are more than likely not designed for additional loads. Often these framing elements were designed at or near capacity. If an engineer is willing to do a full analysis of the existing structure, they may be able to determine if the floor joists are able to accept additional loads or not. But for the purposes of the prescriptive requirements of the DCA-6, this would not be allowed. An additional beam and post would be required near the house. What are the live loads assumed in the DCA-6? Well, structural members and connections shown in DCA-6 have been sized based primarily on a uniform distrib uh, distributed floor load of 40 pounds per square foot and a dead load of 10 pounds per square foot. It should be noted that the IRC tables and values were designed with 40 pounds per square foot loading as well, while the ACA, uh, ASCE 7 requires 1.5 times the live load of the area served, which would then be 60 pounds per square foot. If a deck is not prone to sliding or drifting snow, the criterion DCA 6 can be conservatively applied to a deck with a uniformly distributed snow load of 40 pounds per square foot and a 10 pounds per square foot dead load. Sliding snow loads can pose a much greater risk to a deck than snow drifting loads. And then of course, again, uh, concentrated loads such as a hot tub are not permitted in the DCA-6. Can a ledger be connected through a brick or stone veneer? The DCA-6 would require a non-ledger deck uh, when constructed at a dwelling with a brick, masonry, or stone exterior veneer. If you're using the IRC or engineering design, there may be some uh, brand new products out on the market that would allow this type of connection. But be sure to check the ESR report and the manufacturer's installation instructions if you see these products in your local jurisdiction. Be sure these products are installed correctly and are designed to transfer all necessary loads through the veneer and into the building's structural members while also maintaining any required air gap. Attachment directly to the veneer is not permitted in any design method in the code. Should knee braces be installed on interior deck posts? The DCA-6 only requires knee braces at corner posts. The interior posts have too much uh, gravity loads already. Uh, and so they, any additional lateral load can cause them to be overstressed. As you can see in this chart, uh, the post sizes are based on, on bracing at corner posts only, but not on interior posts. When you, have a in, when you have a brace come into an interior post, you're now introducing additional loading in the center of that, or near the center of that, that post. And these were not designed for that.
Do I need to worry about span reductions for uh, incised lumber? Uh, much like the wet service factors that, we, that I talked about earlier, the DCA6 applies incising factors to the proper species. So you, again, you don't need to worry about those if you're using the span charts in the DCA6. Are there resources for evaluating an existing deck? We have several uh, options listed here. So the DCA6 can certainly be used to uh, evaluate an existing deck. Also, NADRA, the North American Deck and Railing Association, has a deck evaluation checklist that it's created. And that's what's shown here on the graphic. And then also the Forest Product Society has a manual for the inspection of residential wood decks and balconies, which you can also find on their website. So there are uh, certainly some, some resources available for evaluating an existing deck. And if you have any uh, more information, you can use the, you can find the DCA6 uh, at the website that's listed here. It's probably going to be easier though uh, to just visit the main website, awc.org and do a search for DCA6 and have it pop up um, rather than trying to write down this whole website real quick. Um, so awc.org and just do a search for the DCA6 guide. It's free, it's, it's uh, available for download right there on our website. And then last but not least, is there a Spanish version of the DCA6? And, and there is, same thing on our website, uh, awc.org. You can find Spanish versions for both the 2012 and the 2015 versions of the DCA6, depending on which code cycle you're on. All right, now we're through with the residential wood decks and we'll move on to fasteners, uh, both what you find in the NDS and in other locations. This table, start, this table shows which fastener types are covered in the NDS versus those covered by national evaluation reports, also ca called evaluation service reports. Evaluation reports are developed for proprietary products and provide designers and code officials with the appropriate information to design fasteners per the NDS. However, if you are specifying fasteners based on values found in the NDS, bolts, leg screws, and wood screws must conform to the applicable ANSI ASME standards, which are referenced for these fasteners in 11.1.2, 11.1.3, and 11.1.4, and nails and spikes must meet the ASTM requirements specified in 11.1.5 of the NDS. Keep in mind that the NDS will not specify proprietary fasteners, only generic ones. So if you need information on a specific fastener from a specific manufacturer, be sure you look for an evaluation service report. I realize uh, that some people may have never actually looked up fastener values in the NDS, so I wanted to give you a quick visual of what those tables look like. The tables in chapter 12 cover connections for bolts, leg screws, wood screws, and nails in a variety of situations. You'll find tables for uh, sawn lumber to sawn lumber connections, sawn lumber to steel plate connections, sawn lumber to glue lamb connections, glue lamb to steel plate connections, and sawn lumber to concrete connections. Tables are also shown for single or double shear situations. As an example, uh, here I showed table 12J, which is the table for leg screws in single connections, in single shear connections for two pieces of sawn lumber of the same specific gravity. And table 12P, which is common box or sinker steel wire nails, also in single shear, but connecting sawn lumber to a steel plate. To read the tables, you find the combination of the sizes of sawn lumber or steel plates or glue lambs that you have in the left column, and follow that across to the right until you find the specific gravity or species of the wood that you're using. It might be a little hard to read on the screen, uh, but you may notice that in table 12J, there are several Z values shown for each combination of sawn lumber. You need to pay close attention to the orientation of each piece of lumber and the direction that the shear load will be applied. You can find the definitions of each Z value in section 1.6 of the NDS. 
but they will each relate to a different orientation of the two pieces of lumber. There are different design values if the wood grain is parallel or perpendicular to the direction of, of the shear force. As you look through the tables in chapter 12 that we just discussed, you may notice that there are no penetration values shown for each connection. However, if you think about a connection, you can logically assume that a connection where a three inch uh, wood screw is fully embedded into the main wood member will provide more design value than a connection where a wood screw is only penetrating the main member by a half an inch. So how much penetration do you need for these connections? Well, the footnotes to the tables are very important. Tables have to, use have to use assumptions for the penetration values, and some assumptions are shown on this slide. When the minimum penetration values in the NDS are lower than the, what the footnote requires, you would have to multiply the table value by the appropriate adjustment factor as shown. These adjustment factors are simplified calculations, which were derived from more complicated formulas found in NDS 12.3. So you can see for leg screws, for example, the assumed penetration is eight times the diameter of the leg screw. If the penetration value is less, between four times the diameter and eight times the diameter, then the design values will have to be multiplied by the penetration you have divided by eight times the diameter of the leg screw. You can see that wood screws and nails use a similar formula, but their assumed penetration is 10 times the diameter of the wood screw or nail, and their minimum penetration is six times the diameter. If I took a real quick example, um, or I'll take a real quick example for you. If you have a quarter inch leg screw, the assumed penetration would be eight times the quarter inch diameter, which is two inches. If you only had one inch of penetration, that would be four times the diameter. So the adjustment factor would need to be applied. The one inch penetration would be divided by eight times the diameter or two inches. And so you would have to multiply any value in the table by 0.5 to get the actual design value. So now that we know how much penetration is needed, what is the actual dowel length uh, that you use? Well, there's two ways to answer that based on whether the fastener is being designed to resist withdrawal or if it's being designed to resist shear. The fastener, for fasteners in withdrawal, the details are included in NDS sections 12.1 and 12.2. You can see on the top part of the slide that leg screws do not include the length of the tapered tip when calculating values in withdrawal. However, wood screws and nails do include the tapered tip. It should also be noted that for any fastener that is partially threaded, you would only measure the length of the thread when it is being used to prevent withdrawal. For fasteners and shear, the details are found in NDS section 12.3.5.3. On the bottom part of the slide, you can see that when calculating dowel length and shear, if a fastener has a tapered tip, you can use half of that length. If you need to find the tip length for a leg screw, you can find that value in Appendix L. But for wood screws or nails, the tapered tip is assumed to be two times the diameter. Also, please note that when the fastener is acting in shear, the length is based on the actual fastener length, even if threaded, partially threaded or not threaded at all. So when you're in shear, the threads do not matter. Here's the table I just mentioned uh, that you can find in Appendix L, which will show the tapered tip length of a, of a leg screw. The NDS provides all the critical dimensions of standard fasteners, including length of, length of threads, overall length, length of tap tapered tip, and several others. Once again, keep in mind that the NDS provides figures and values for generic fasteners. If you have a specific proprietary fastener, please refer to the evaluation services report or the manufacturer's specifications for those values. A question that we often get is, does the type of wood affect fastener values? And yes, quite a bit. Uh, the, type, the type and specific gravity of the wood being used plays a big part in determining the capacity of the fastener. I showed you the tables for a couple different connection situations earlier and each of them required you to know the specific gravity or species of the wood that's being used. Wood with a higher specific gravity will provide higher design values. The NDS and the NDS supplement provide tables in several locations to determine the specific gravity of most wood species or species combinations. 
All right, so that's enough to talk about specific fastener values for a little bit. Let's talk about applying the fasteners. This graphic shows two different situations, each with two wood structural panels butting up against each other, centered on one framing member. In the picture on the left, the fasteners are staggered from one panel to the other, uh, but they are in a straight line as you move up the framing member. In the picture on the right, the fasteners are directly across from each other from one panel to the other, but they're staggered vertically as they go up the framing member. The picture on the right is the correct way to stagger fasteners. If fasteners are close together and in a line as they run parallel to the grain of the wood, they are at a high risk of splitting the wood on the framing member. Also note, uh, the required edge distance from the center line of the nail to the edge of the wood structural panel is typically 3 8 inch minimum, although in some cases it could be a half inch minimum. This distance is a minimum and shear can have better performance when the edge distance is greater. If the edge distance is increased, the nails can be slightly angled into the framing member to maintain the edge distance of the framing. And here's, ex here's an example of that. Uh, this shows how nails can be driven at an angle to achieve proper edge distance of the nail. Please note that the nails that are shown that are shown here are an exaggerated at, at an exaggerated angle, just so you can see it a little bit better. It should also be noted that only the specific uh, the specified edge distance is to the panel edge. There's no specified distance to the edge of a framing member. The slight angle of the nail into the framing is done to ensure that that the nail penetrates into the framing instead of splitting off the side of the framing member. All right, so here's something that you may have seen out in the field or, or seen before. Earlier we, took, we talked about how splitting the wood could occur if fasteners were too close to each other and in a line parallel to the grain of the wood. You can see an example of that here. The bonds between the wood fibers are weaker than the bonds along a wood fiber. So wood will split parallel to the fibers as opposed to across the fibers. When putting fasteners in a line parallel to the fibers, you need to space them apart to avoid splitting the wood. So here's an example of, of uh, three different examples here of, of nails in wood. The picture in the middle uh, is the picture that we just saw the slide before. The two fasteners are too close together and they're in a line parallel to the grain and you can see that the splitting has occurred. In the picture on the right, you can see two fasteners which are staggered, as we mentioned earlier, and there's no splitting. In the picture on the left, uh, that, that's the real important one. Uh, you can see that there's splitting in the parallel direction between the fasteners, but not across the grain, even though the fasteners are much closer to each other across the grain. This is a critical point in designing wood connections. Wood does not split across or perpendicular to the grain. Uh, those fasteners are fairly close to each other, perpendicular to the grain, but there's no splitting there. The splitting runs parallel to the grain. I should also note at this point that fasteners being too close to each other is not the only way that wood splits. Uh, there's differential shrinkage or other factors that could also cause splitting. But the big takeaway here is that there is no splitting across the grain. Next, we're going to pick up with a few basic ideas on wood connection behavior. The first fact is that wood likes, a lo likes load applied as com uh, compression parallel to the grain. This is the strongest mode of wood. Structural designs that capitalize on this ide idea are very economical, attractive, and consistent with the wood's heritage. There's a reason that, it, that why a tree grows the way that it does. Those fibers or grains are very strong in compression, so a tree can grow very tall and strong. Also, compression connections in wood are very easy to design in detail. If we can exploit the natural strength of the wood, we can create economical designs for those connections. The picture in the center here is a great example of that. The fasteners that are in that connection are more likely just being there, uh, used to hold the wood in place on the base and maybe resist a little uplift or lateral load. But the natural fibers in the wood are providing most of the work to transfer the loads into the base. Here are a couple more pictures to emphasize that point. Wood likes load applied as compression parallel to the grain. Again, this is the strongest mode of wood. 
Would you rather stand on a platform that's on top of a two by four post, or would you rather stand on a platform that's in the mid span of a two by four laid across the wide opening? Now that we know how wood wants to be connected, what's the best way to connect wood? Wood typically likes to see loads spread out over a large area if possible, so several fasteners are usually a good idea. A key point to consider, uh, a key point in connector choice is scale relative to the wood product being connected. Often this will automatically dictate that the fasteners are small. Imagine a two by eight floor joist with a joist hanger on the end. I'm sure you're picturing a connection with several nails in it. If those fasteners were three quarter inch bolts instead, you can imagine that the joist would not be able to withstand as much load because the scale of the fasteners would be too big and there wouldn't be enough wood left on the end to have a solid connection. So smaller fasteners and lots of them is a much better design. When designing wood connections, remember that wood likes to see loads spread out. Concentrated loads should be avoided as it could easily exceed the bearing capacities, capabilities of the wood. On the left, one could potentially see crushing type failures when the bearing load gets too high. Spreading the load out not only reduces the load per fastener, it also builds in a degree of redundancy, and that's generally a good thing in construction. We always like to see redundancy in construction. You think about uh, wall studs, floor joists, roof trusses, um, redundancy is used quite a bit uh, in, in construction. To be fair, it should be noted that there are several, that there are times when several larger connections are better than dozens of smaller connections. As I mentioned earlier, you do need to take into account the scale of the connection in relationship to the wood. There is a constructability factor and even an, an aesthetics uh, factor that could come into play. If a connection gets too big, it's not going to work properly. So you need to find that proper balance. So now that I just got done telling you that you should use many fasteners, uh, here's an example of a connection with a single fastener. If done well, a single fastener connection could work. If you need a connection to be designed and detailed to function like a pin, the single fastener approach is not necessarily bad. Because this connection is partially exposed to the elements, however, in, in this picture, uh, you can have more movement and stresses caused by the changes in weather. And with those stresses, it would likely be good to have more fasteners. Again, that redundancy in, in construction is always good. But there are situations where a single fastener connection could be used properly. So how do these uh, principles apply to prefabricated connectors? There's many prefabricated connectors, and here I've shown an example of a post base and a post cap. Regardless of which manufacturer you prefer, these are very useful products and save considerable construction time on connections. As you can see, the connector manufacturers typically prefer to use smaller fasteners and more of them. Also note that as we spoke about earlier, the fasteners that are in a line parallel to the grain are typically spread apart. When you see two fasteners close to each other, they're perpendicular to the grain from each other. So there are a few concerns with splitting of the wood. I'll leave this slide up here for a second so you can follow the parallel lines between fasteners and you can see how, how spread apart they are. Joists or beam hangers are also very useful products and save considerable construction uh, connection time. Note that just like in the previous slide, for the most part, the, the various manufacturers are using a series of smaller fasteners for the, connect, for the connectors and a large number of those smaller fasteners per connector. And again, the fasteners which are in a line parallel to the grain are spread out apart from each other. Fasteners that are close to each other are always across the grain perpendicular to each other. This slide shows a, a well thought out design solution using a combination of pre-engineered connectors, truss plates, and bolt patterns to secure the trusses. <clears throat> truss, plate, truss plates are usually proprietary and the plates creating the connection typically cannot be modified in the field, but we'll talk more about that later. So our joist hangers covered by the NDS. We briefly touched on joist hangers a slide or two ago. Uh, they do save considerable time during construction by simplifying connections. However, these are proprietary products and therefore they're not covered by the NDS. Whenever you get any prefabricated connectors in the field, 
make sure you get an evaluation service report with them to make sure that they're being installed correctly and used for the correct application. I've seen prefabricated connectors used many times in the field in a way that they were not intended to be used. I also want to note that prefabricated connectors cannot be modified in the field. I'm sure we've all seen prefabricated connectors hammered out flat or bent so that they uh, fit into a situation on the job site. When you come across something like that, make sure that they replace them with a proper connector. Every once in a while, we'll get a question about timber rivet connectors. So can you still use those? Timber rivet, timber rivet connections have been used in the US and Canada for several decades, uh, but again, they are somewhat rare. Regardless, we feel it's important to make sure that you're aware of the benefits uh, of timber rivet connectors. The design criteria introduced in chapter 14 of the NDS apply to joints, joints with, steel plate, with steel side plates for either, either southern pine or western species glue lamb timber. Provisions in the specification are applicable only to timber rivets that are hot dip galvanized. Rivets, rivets are made with a standard shank cross section and standard head dimensions and those can be found in Appendix M of the NDS. And the only variation in the, in the rivet itself is to the length. Because of the test results and property values for each species, which were used to develop the rivet bending and wood capacity equations, the use of the design values based on the provisions of 14.2.2 in the NDS is limited to only dug fir larch and southern pine glue lamb timber. The 2018 NDS specifies timber rivets made of mild steel and plates of A36 steel. Further, design provisions and values in the 2018 NDS were applicable only to timber rivets that are hot dip galvanized. Plates also need to be hot dip galvanized if the connection is in wet service. This is all described in the NDS section 14.1.1. Good practice is to always uh, hot dip the galvanized metal components for corrosive or exposed environments and in situations where the structure may be exposed to the elements for a long construction period that may otherwise result in streaking stains on the wood that can be that can prove uh, very difficult to remove. Those can be unsi unsightly if the final structure is meant to be exposed for aesthetics. Also consider that uh, differential corrosion can take place if you're not using the same materials. Each rivet shall, in all cases, be placed with its major cross-sectional dimension aligned parallel to the grain of the wood. Design criteria are based on rivets driven through circular holes into the side plates until the heads are firmly seated, but rivets are not to be driven flush. Timber rivets at the perimeter of, of the group shall be driven first, and the remaining timber rivets shall be driven in a spiral pattern from the outside to the center of the group. Once again, because of the species test results and property values used to develop the rivet bending and wood capacity equations, only Douglas fir larch and southern pine glue lamb timbers may be used. One reason to consider the use of timber rivets is the load carrying capacity, typically measured in the tens of kips. This is a very high capacity connection uh, for wood. Okay, moving on from timber rivets. These next few slides will discuss some of the recent changes uh, in AWC's uh, special design provisions for wood and seismic standard, which is known as SPIDWIS. I'm sure you've run into a situation like this on the job site where the contractor is using whatever fasteners they have on the truck to install a shear wall or diaphragm. So a common, we, common question that we get asked is, can any fasteners be used in the shear wall, in a shear wall or a diaphragm? This slide is showing table 4.2A from SPIDWIS. It's one of the tables listing the shear capacities for wood frame diaphragms using nails. Diaphragm capacities are based on common nails only of various penny weight and with specific minimum penetration. If using this table, you must use only common ASTM F1667 common nails. As mentioned earlier, the dimensions for these nails can be found in NDS Appendix L. Also, please note, when you go into, the, into these tables, there are different tables for seismic, 
which is uh, box A in the center, and the wind, which is box B on the right. Be sure you're looking up the proper shear capacity values for whichever load is governing. That last table, again, was for diaphragms. Now let's look at the corresponding table for shear walls. SPIDWIS table 4.3A for shear wall capacities are based on common or galvanized box nails of various penny weight and with a specific minimum penetration. If you recall, diaphragms only allow uh, for common nails uh, while the shear walls here can use common or galvanized box nails. Please note that the table also provides a minimum penetration length. Some people are interpreting, and there's the minimum penetration length. Some people are interpreting the tables incorrectly and in specifying other types of short nails that meet the minimum penetration and the same diameter as a common or box nail. However, the table capacities are only based on the common and box nails for shear walls. In other words, other types of short nails may not provide the, the uh, capacities that are shown in these tables. This table cannot be used for sinker nails, uh, roof sheathing, ring shank nails, or other nails. In December of 2018, testing was undertaken with the primary goal being to determine the shear wall performance achieved by the 10 penny short nail. Uh, for sheathing attachment. Testing of shear walls using 10 penny common nails in full size and in short lengths showed that there is a difference in strength that the short nail is used. You need the extra nail length to develop the full strength of the perimeter nails. So if you do get to a job site and you find the contractor has been using a fastener that's not in the NDS, what can you do? Well, there are some of the uh, there are some of the sources here to find specifications for those fasteners that are not in the NDS. Yield mold equations can be used for calculating shear capacities for any dowel-shaped fastener. There are a set of yield mold equations uh, in the NDS and another set that's found in AWC's Technical Report 12, which can, all, which can be found, found on our website. The yield uh, equations found in NDS and Technical Report 12 will mathematically provide the same results. However, uh, the technical, 12, uh, technical Report 12 does allow for more flexibility. It allows for things like gaps between the connected members, uh, effects of partial threaded lengths in the members, effects of connecting to hollow steel members, uh, such as pipes and other things like that. Besides the yield mode equations, you can also use a third party report, such as an evaluation service report, which I've mentioned a few times already. ICC's ESR reports are, are very easy to find and locate. If you've never gone to their website, uh, and that's www.icc-es.org, and I've got that on the screen there, uh, they do have a great searchable database. Uh, one example that's very useful, uh, or that is a very useful evaluation report, is ESR 1539 from iSanta. And iSanta is the International Staple Nail and Tool Association. The iSanta website, which is www.isanta.org, has some very user-friendly bulletins uh, that will help explain how to use the ESR 1539 that I just mentioned. You can also get the latest copy of the report for free uh, to make sure that you're not using an older version. And if you go on there again, you can see uh, on the screenshot here that they do have the ESR 1519, uh, both to click on a link to get the download, or also uh, there's a QR code that you can scan to get to the, the ESR 1539 right away. And then you can see the links below, which have different uh, technical resources on how to use that 1539. This is an example of what you can find in the ESR 1539. There's a lot of values to be found within the various tables included within the report. This is showing table one, which describes the different types of nail fasteners included in ESR 1539. The report includes helpful tables for diaphragm capacities, which is shown here in table six, and another for uh, shear walls and the fasteners included in the report. This is very similar to table 4.2a found in SPIDWIS that we talked about earlier.
Now let's jump back to the ICC uh, ES website for a second. The ICC website is very user-friendly to find evaluation service reports. You can search by a product, a manufacturer, or by a general material. For example, on your screen now is what pops up if you do a search for wood screw. You can see that seven different manufacturers have ES reports for wood screws. And of course, when uh, dealing with anything that's, that's not found in the code, uh, section R104.11 can always come into play for any type of fasteners. The designer would need to use the alternative materials, design, and methods of construction and equipment section of the code and possibly provide an evaluation service report or other test reports. And of course, the building official always has the final approval whenever using this section of the code. Another common question that we get asked is uh, questions about fasteners in wet conditions. Fasteners used with treated wood are required to meet R317.3 of the IRC. When fasteners used in wet or damp locations or when used with preservative treated wood, most people think that means that the fastener needs to be hot dip, zinc coated galvanized steel or stainless steel. But there are also allowances in the code for them to be silicone, bronze or copper. Keep in mind uh, that this goes for the entire fastener, which includes the washers and nuts that are used with the preservative treated wood or located in wet or damp locations. These same requirements also apply to fasteners in contact with fire retardant treated wood used on the exterior of the building. When you have fire retardant treated wood that's used on the interior of the building, please refer to the manufacturer's specifications for proper use. In the DCA6 guide that we talked about earlier in the deck section, uh, if the fasteners are exposed to salt water, there is a requirement that they can only be stainless steel fasteners. This includes properties that are near the ocean and uh, also potentially at a saltwater pool, if you have a deck around a saltwater pool. All right, so let's talk about nails in general here a little bit. Uh, these are the typical head configurations used in construction and in particular with power tools or power nailers. These styles, these styles are, intended to be used, uh, are intended for use in nailers and are collated to maximize the number of nails per pack and for the use in the particular type of tool for the job. These are driven by a hammer or specific uh, power nailers. On the left, you can see a typical full round head nail. The three examples on the right have deformed heads and are commonly found connected as shown below each head. First, a little bit about how these nails are formed. The head is formed in the tooling when the end of the wire is struck with a device, which is appropriately named a hammer, which comes from the material to cold, which causes the material uh, to cold flow into a cavity of the tooling, which forms the head. There are limitations in forming the head. The material will only consistently flow so far, and the applied force to form the head is limited or else premature tool wear could take place. The full round head nail on the right would be covered uh, by ASTM F1667, which is, standard, which is the standard specification for driven fasteners, nails, spikes, and staples, which is the standard used in the NDS and SpidWiz. For the other head configurations, information on those would need to come from the ESR 1539 from iSanta that we talked about earlier. I will make this note though, uh, the F1667, which again, that's the standard used by NDS and SpidWiz, uh, that will allow heads to be of unspecified dimensions for some nails, especially nail, nail tables intended for power tool nails. So one can argue flexibility in the head size and shape, uh, in head size and shape is covered by the F1667, uh, but the issue is that full round head nails are the typical reference nail sizes in codes and standards pres uh, prescriptive tables. Because of this, it's best to use the design values found in ESR 1539 if you have one of those deformed heads. Much like the difference in head configuration, the shank of each nail can also be different, so which ones are covered? 
The NDS has recently been updated to distinguish between smooth shank nails and spikes and deformed shank nails. This slide shows the difference between nails with a smooth shank, the first picture on the left, and a deformed shank, the three pictures on the right. The smooth shank nails are the result of forming round wire into a nail. A feature to note on the, on the shank is the gripper marks that are below the nail, the nail head. The wire is firmly gripped to hold into place during the former forming of the nail, creating this feature on the shank. Gripper marks are not a performance enhancing feature of the nail. Ring shank nails are created by special machinery and tooling that deform the, sh the smooth shank after the nail is formed. The material of the shank is compressed and rolled. This forms the root diameter. The design of the tool then allows the material compressed into the root to flow out to form the crest diameter. You can see this in the graphic in the center of the page where the root diameter and the crest diameter are pointed out. The difference between the root diameter and the crest diameter is referred to as ring growth. The spacing between the rings, shown as P in the graphic, is the pitch and referenced as rings per inch or RPI. Screw shank nails, which are sometimes known as twist shanks, are created by compressing and twisting. Like the ring shank nail, uh, they will, there will be growth on the crest of the twist as material is moved out from the root area. Only the smooth shank and the ring shank nails are covered in the NDS. The other two nails, the screw shanks and the barbed shanks, are not included in the NDS, but you may be able to find, the spe uh, specific, find specifications for them in evaluation service reports. No matter if you have a nail covered by the NDS or a proprietary nail covered by an evaluation service report, one needs to distinguish between the smooth and deformed shank because each will have a different capacity for withdrawal. Tabulated shear wall and diaphragm values are critical. Because of this, fastener type and size, minimum fastener penetration, minimum panel thickness, and sheathing material need to be specified on the plans and followed in the field. There are too many different manufacturers of the different nail types and penny weights to not list the specifics. Otherwise, as I mentioned earlier, you could just get a contractor using any fasteners that they find on their truck. As an example, a 10 penny common nail in the tables needs to be three inches long with a 0.148 inch shank diameter and a 0.312 inch head diameter. These are intended to be minimum sizes for the 10 penny nails on the job site when using table L4 in Appendix L of the NDS or table A1 in SpidWiz. I wanna talk a little bit more about some of the changes to the 2018 NDS. Many jurisdictions are now starting to move to the 2021 IRC. So I wanna make sure that everyone is aware of a few updates to the 2018 NDS that may now come into play for you. Revisions to the NDS connection design provisions were primarily in response to a significant increase in components and cladding roof wind pressures in the 2016 ASCE 7 minimum design loads and associated criteria for building and other structures. Wind uplift related changes include new fastener withdrawal and new fastener head pull through de design provisions. So let's review those briefly and do a quick example. As I mentioned earlier, uh, roof sheathing ring shank nails were recently added to the ASTM F1667. Because of that, uh, the design provisions for roof sheathing ring shank nails have been added to the 2018 NDS. There were several revisions to the 20 uh, to section 12.1.6 to accommodate the roof sheathing ring shank nails. These include adding a new table in Appendix L for the dimensions of the nails, which is shown in that box. A requirement that they meet ASTM F1667, which is in the under, some of the underlying text on the right, and adding language to require head diameters to be specified to ensure compliance with the head pull through requirements. Also in some of the underlying text on the right. NDS 12.2.3 was also updated, which covers smooth shank nails or spikes. 
The smooth shank nails or spikes now include bright or galvanized carbon steel and stainless steel nails or spikes. The stainless steel nail or spike is new to the NDS. The 2018 NDS is the first edition to specifically address the withdrawal strength of smooth shank stainless steel nails. The NDS provisions have been updated to distinguish between smooth shank nails and spikes and deformed shank nails again, such as roof sheathing ring shank nails. A new equation for the withdrawal strength of smooth shank stainless, stainless steel nails was added. Stainless steel nails have lower withdrawal strength when compared to carbon steel wire nails of the same diameter due to the reduced surface friction of the stainless steel. The new stainless steel nail withdrawal equation produces lower values of withdrawal strength than the NDS steel wire nail equation based on tests of smooth shank carbon steel wire nails. The reduction in withdrawal strength due to, the, due to the reduced friction provided by the stainless steel varies from 5% to 40% over a common range of wood specific gravity, which the, with the greatest reduction associated with high specific gravity wood. You can see that on the chart here. Because of this, a new equation for the withdrawal strength of smooth shank stainless steel nails was needed. Stainless steel nails have a lower withdrawal strength when compared to carbon steel wire nails of the same diameter due to the reduced surface friction of stainless steel. The differences in withdrawal strength vary with the specific gravity of the wood as shown on this graph. When stainless steel nails are specified as an alternative to, com to commonly prescribed smooth shank carbon steel wire nails, the these differences in nail withdrawal strength must be considered. For example, where a smooth shank stainless steel nail uh, is used for a roof sheathing attachment, more nails or nails of greater length or diameter may be required to provide equivalent withdrawal strength uh, withdrawal strength performance for wind wood in uplift for wind uplift. Sorry. All right. As I just mentioned, roof sheathing ring shank nails have a higher withdrawal value than smooth shank nails, so they provide additional options for efficient attachment of wood structural panel roof sheathing. In many cases, specification of roof sheathing ring shank nails will produce a reduced roof sheathing attachment schedule than permissible by use of smooth shank nails, and they enable the use of a single minimum fastener schedule for roof perimeter edge zones and interior zones. Recognition of higher withdrawal strength in the NDS is based on presences of standardized ring deformations, including a minimum inch and a half length uh, that of, of deformations on the nail. In a related change, tabular values for generic threaded hardened nails, which had no standardized deformation pattern, were deleted to remove uh, an approximately 10% increase in withdrawal values for such nails relative to smooth shank nails of equivalent diameter. The revised NDS provisions allow uh, these generic, generic deformed shank nails in accordance with ASTM F1667 to use withdrawal design values for smooth shank nails. Now here's a partial of that table that was updated in the NDS. The red outline part represents the new addition to the table that reflects the new roof sheathing ring shank nails in the standard. Previously, this table only contained the post frame ring shank nails. In the footnotes, the red underline section is also some newly added text. Fastener head pull through data was used uh, to set industry recommendations for wood structural panels. This was combined with historical data from tests, tests of lumber and plywood and was analyzed to develop the new fastener head pull through provisions. Within the range of head diameters, thicknesses and specific gravities in the NDS, the analysis found that head pull through is related to the perimeter of the fastener head. New equations based on fastener head diameter, specific gravity, and net side member thickness were added. And here's what I'm talking about with head pull through. Although this is a, a test from a, this is a graphic picture from a shear wall test, uh, this does show nail heads that pulled through the sheathing. You can see at least three nails still attached to the bottom plate, 
but the head of the nail pulled through the sheathing. Again, that test data showed that head pull through was related to head perimeter, which is why head diameter is so critical to be specified. So let's do a quick example so you can see this all in action. I won't get too heavy into the engineering, uh, but we do have some other courses on our website that you can find if you are interested in, in getting into the weeds on this a little bit more. But let's take a quick look at this roof sheathing uh, fastener. This nail is connecting the roof sheathing to a, to a truss or rafter. The load on the sheathing uh, halfway to the next truss or rafter on either side is the amount of uplift that the fastener is required to resist. So here's a little bit more about our design example. You can see that this is a three inch long roof sheathing ring shank nail connecting 7 16 OSB to a, two by, to a two by six rafter. Earlier in this presentation, we discussed which dowel length to use when you're designing uh, for withdrawal or shear. Because this, resisting, because this fastener is resisting withdrawal forces, you, can, you may recall that we use the thread length, not the actual length of the nail. Therefore, we have uh, one and a half inches of the capacity of the nail for withdrawal. And here's the dimensions from Appendix L in the NDS for the roof sheathing ring shank nail, where we can find that thread length. Uh, don't be distracted on the left with the colon and equal sign. That just comes from the MathCAD program that we use to create this slide example. Um, but the uh, graphic in the middle there or on the right side is, is really the, the information that we're looking for here. This is a continuation of the example uh, showing the equations used to calculate the resistance of that nail based on the specific gravity of the wood that it, it is connecting to and the length of the threads. So this roof sheathing ring shank nail can resist 88 pounds in this application. And that's of, of just straight uplift. Remember, different wood species have different design values. So don't assume that a three inch roof sheathing ring shank nail will always have a resistance of 88 pounds in withdrawal. Now previously, uh, you'd be done right there. You'd have your 88 pounds and, you'd, and you would move on. But now we have new equations for head pull through. So let's check those in our example. When you run through those calculations, you can see that based on the head side, the head size and sheathing thickness, uh, that nail will only have the capacity of 67 pounds before the head will pull through the sheathing. This is lower than the 88 pounds that the nail itself can withdraw and uh, can resist in withdrawal that we found on the previous slide. Now there may be other adjustment factors that could come into play here. Uh, before you get a final design value. But just using these, these two simple equations, uh, you can see how critical the head pull through is uh, on roof sheathing. One final note on fasteners before we move on is about the uh, stresses and connections uh, when using multiple fasteners. Appendix E was added to the NDS to make sure that fasteners in groups are checked for failures. That's what Appendix E looks like right there. Through testing, it was learned that where a fastener group is composed of closely spaced fasteners loaded parallel to grain, the capacity of the fastener group may be limited by wood failure at the net section or by tear out around the fasteners caused by local stresses. Earlier, we talked about splitting wood if two fasteners were too close parallel to the grain. Well, this is uh, similar to that concept, but just on a larger scale. By increasing the spacing between fasteners, much higher capacity and ductility is achieved even with fewer fasteners. So again, spread out those fasteners parallel to the grain. Okay, we're done with fasteners. Now we can move on to a few other topics. So next up, we'll, we'll talk about some detailing considerations. And so what type of shear walls are detailed in the SpidWiz? There's three types of shear walls uh, or shear wall options that you have in the SpidWiz. You have individual full height wall segments, force transfer around openings, and perforated shear walls. The individual full height wall segment method requires overturning restraint for each segment, typically with hold down devices. The force transfer round opening method requires the design for force distribution around openings, which allows for narrower full height sections and utilization of the shear capacity of the sheathing above and below openings. And the, perfor and the perforated shear, uh, shear wall method has special detailing that uses a combination of bottom plate nailing and the sheathing above and below openings 
to provide partial overturning restraint at openings. Each method has its own advantages and disadvantages, but make sure you know which method is being used so that you can apply the, cro the code correctly. So again, uh, here is the individual full height wall segment method. Uh, this is your traditional method for creating a shear wall. Each individual seg segment of shear walls are required to have hold downs on each end. In between the segments, there can be openings, but the sheathing that may or may not be uh, present around openings do not transfer any load. You are just looking at the full height wall segments. Force transfer around, uh, around opening shear walls are just that, uh, shear walls where the loads transfer through the sheathing around openings. Collectors are installed above and below openings to transfer loads from one full height wall segment to the next. A full height wall segment is required at each end of the shear wall to transfer those loads into the foundation, and full height wall segments are required to be at least two feet wide. I want to call your attention to uh, limitation five in the force transfer around opening shear walls. This section previously said that collectors for shear walls shall be provided for the entire length of the wall. This was intended to just apply to the collectors used to transfer loads from the diaphragm to the shear wall. Based on questions that we received through our help desk, we found that this requirement was incorrectly being applied to the collectors around the openings as well. The 2021 SpidWiz fixed that issue and clarified, that require, and clarified the requirement. Limitation five now says that collectors for, for, for shear, uh, collectors for shear transfer shall be provided between the diaphragm and the shear wall for, full, for the full length of the shear wall. The 2021 SpidWiz also added limitation one to further clarify that there is a difference between the collectors around openings and the collectors between the diaphragm and the shear wall. Here's a graphic of what that looks like. The dashed line at the top of the wall shows the collector between the diaphragm and the shear wall. And again, that's required to be full length. Uh, and then the um, dashed lines at the top and the bottom of the opening show the, collector, the collectors that are used to transfer force around the openings. The intention of limitation five for the collector at the top of the wall, uh, the, the intent of limitation five is for the collector at the top of the wall to transfer shear forces between the diaphragm and the shear wall and not for the straps to transfer the forces around the openings. The straps around the openings need to be long enough to transfer the forces, but do not need to run the entire length of the wall. This was something that we are seeing misapplied often. And last but not least, the third option for shear walls is the perforated shear wall. These are shear walls with openings, but where the force does not transfer around those openings. All right, so a truss member uh, is broken during construction or during installation, can it be repaired? Unfortunately, trusses occasionally get damaged during installation uh, or transport to the job site. In addition to, in addition to that, Trusses may get accidentally cut, notched, or drilled in the field. Sometimes plans change during construction and new loads may be introduced onto a truss or loads could be moved. The IRC addresses these conditions in R802.10.4. I do want to emphasize the importance of, this, of uh, the section in this paragraph which addresses changes in loading. I think many inspectors, contractors, and design professionals will easily notice if a truss segment is damaged or was accidentally cut. But oftentimes a rooftop unit that was supposed to go in one location uh, accidentally gets moved and is not as easily noticed. Oftentimes in fast track design build projects, the HVAC unit locations may not even be designed by the time the trusses are built and installed. So pay close attention to the loads on the trusses and bring that up to any design professionals, if you, or bring that up to the design professional if you see any discrepancies. If a truss is altered in any way, uh, they are in violation of, of section R802.10.4, but all is not lost. Repairs can be made in accordance with the designs provided by the engineer or design professional. Structural calculations will generally accompany repair drawings. Keep in mind that repair drawing that repairs, uh, or keep in mind that a repair that works for one truss is not necessarily the same repair that can be used on the next truss or the next project. What is shown here on the on the slide is an example of a repair. This is not a repair for all projects. 
Every repair needs to be designed for that specific building, for that specific truss, with that specific loading, in that specific location, and for that specific member of the truss. They are not reusable for another project. When you get a truss repair, make sure that it has the address of the project on the structural calculations. So you make sure that it, it is for that project. And here's an example of what that repair may look like out in the field. There'll be uh, specified nailing patterns, uh, specified uh, thicknesses of the, of the sheathing. Everything should be laid out for you when you get that repair. Another question that we get asked often, uh, some glue lamps have a top label on them and some do not. So what's the difference? A beam that's labeled top utilizes an unbalanced layup where stronger laminations are used on the bottom or the tension side of the beam. In order to assure that beams manufactured using an unbalanced layup are installed correctly, the word top is clearly stamped on the top surface of the beam. So let's, let's explain that a little bit more. There, there's basically two types of designs for glue lambs. You have balanced and unbalanced, and each one has a different use. For members stressed primarily in bending, a graded layup of lumber is used throughout, with, uh, throughout the depth of the beam with the highest quality laminations used in the outer zones of the beam where the bending stresses are the highest. Lower quality laminations are used in zones subject to lower bending stresses. You can see the difference between the balanced and unbalanced layup here. We'll get into this more in the next couple slides. In an unbalanced layup, the highest grade laminations are used from the bottom tension lambs where the stresses are the highest. Lower grade laminations are used for the compression zone at the top and the lowest grade is used in the middle or the shear zone of the glue lamb. Stresses are lower in these areas during in-service loading. An unbalanced layup is intended to be used in simple span applications or short cantilever con uh, conditions where only the bottom of the beam is subject to maximum tension stresses. Again, unbalanced layups are marked with, the, with top on the top, so the installer installs the glue lamb with the highest grade laminations on the bottom in the tension zone. For a balanced beam, the grade of laminations of the member are symmetrical. Higher grade laminations are used symmetrically on the top and the bottom of the beam. This type of member is typically used for cantilevers or continuous multi-span beams, which may have either the top or the bottom of the member stressed in tension. The top is not marked on these beams because they're symmetrical, so it doesn't really matter which, which side is up. Sometimes beams with unbalanced layups are installed incorrectly. In this case, looking up from the ground, one shouldn't see the top of the beam. It should be obvious, but the word top, uh, but when the word top appears on a beam, that side always needs to be installed up. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. In the past, the bending value of a 12F beam was cut in half when installed upside down. Following full beam testing by APA, the allowable reverse moment capacity was increased from 50% reduction to now allow 75% of the normal capacity on many beam layups. If confronted on the job site with an unbalanced glue lamb that was installed upside down, all might not be lost. An engineer or design professional may be able to justify that the glue lamb still has adequate strength to resist the loading. However, until that can be determined, construction should stop so as not to overload a glue lamb that may not be adequately sized. If this situation is discovered early enough during construction, it may be cheaper, quicker, and easier to just remove and replace the glue lamb rather than stopping construction until that justification can be approved. Another question that we get asked often is how tall can a stud be? Uh, well, the prescriptive design tables in the IRC uh, is table R602.3, parent 5, which allows bearing stud, stud walls to go up to 10 feet and non-load bearing stud walls to be up to 20 feet. Table R602.3 parent 6 provides an alternative design, which would allow bearing walls to use 11 foot and 12 foot tall studs. Anything beyond these lengths would have to be designed by a design professional or engineer. Keep in mind that there is a slenderness ratio applied to any column, which would also include studs. That ratio may, be, uh, may also limit the height of a stud being used. So now that we're through with some of the detailing considerations, we'll move on to a couple of general and odd topics. 
So a, a question I get asked a lot is just why does wood have different strength values based on the direction of the load? I brought this up earlier when we were talking about uh, fasteners and connections, um, but it's a good time to explore that a little bit more. Wood is composed of elongated, round, or rectangular tube-like cells. Here's a, a very simplified illustration of this. Let's model the cellular nature of wood with a group of straws. When compression is applied, as shown on the left, the straw bundle is strong and connecting the ends is very simple. If you think of the hands in the picture here as the connectors, you can visualize that the connectors in compression would not need a lot of design, just something to keep the straw bundle from sliding off. And that's if, it, if it's only in compression. Applying tension also develops considerable tensile strength in the straw bundle. So same thing, imagine trying to pull those uh, straws apart now with the, with the connector hands. However, hanging on to the end becomes more of a challenge in designing a suitable connection. You can imagine that your hands would slip off the straw bundle long before the straws would rip apart. If a load is applied perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the straws, as pictured on the right, the straws would potentially crush because of the much weaker radial alignment orientation of the cellular walls. If you picture somebody holding the straw bundle with their hands on each end, and a second person applying a force like the picture on the right, you can probably imagine that the straw bundle will not be able to withstand a lot of force before it deflects and falls down. It would more than likely be ripped out of uh, one hand or both at the connection points, making those connections uh, a little bit more difficult. This illustrates the nature of wood. There are different strength properties depending on the direction that a force is applied. This is just another closer look at, at the bundle of straws. If looking at wood under a microscope, if you are looking at wood under a microscope, the cells might kind of look like this close up. Again, think about how the cellular makeup of the wood affects the strength properties and the connectors. Earlier, I spoke about splitting the wood if, you're, if you have two fasteners in line parallel to the grain. This may be a better way to visualize how two nails that get too close uh, parallel to the grain could split the wood but nails that are close to each other perpendicular to the grain would not. Another type of lumber which has gained popularity in recent times is finger jointed or end jointed lumber. It gets its name from uh, the unique method of cutting the, the ends of two pieces of lumber with interlocking fingers that get glued together. This is one of three different types of structural glued dimensional lumber, the other two being edge glued lumber and face glued lumber. The building code allows finger jointed lumber to be used interchangeably with normal lumber in many instances. Two things to note include the vertical use only or HRA stamps. Vertical use only indicates that members should only should not be used in bending applications unless the loading is only a short duration like wind loading. Vertical use only lumber would typically be used as wall studs. Where the lumber needs to be utilized for a fire resistive assembly, it must be made with heat resistant adhesive, which can be identified by the HRA stamp, which of course stands for heat resistant adhesive. The 2012 IBC clarified this requirement that HRA stamped finger jointed lumber is required for fire resistant rated assemblies. The grade stamp shown on the left calls out both vertical use only and heat resistant adhesives so this would be acceptable to be used in a rated stud wall assembly. The grade stamp on the right only has the HRA stamp, so this, uh, so this piece of wood could be used in any fire resistant assembly, not just in a stud wall. If you'd like to learn more, uh, the Western Wood Products Association website has some great resources for finger jointed or other structural glued dimensional lumber. You can find that at www.wwpa.org. Are permanent wood foundations permitted by code? Uh, the IRC permits permanent wood foundations in R402.1 and R404.2. There's also a reference in, 401, in R401.1 to permit the use of AWC's permanent wood foundation design specification. This document was recently updated for 2021. Uh, these are not found in, in many areas of the country, but can be popular in some localized areas. I personally have not come across these yet, uh, but I have heard from some code officials in the Midwest who say that they still are in use today. 
So are all redwoods and cedars considered naturally durable? This is a very common question. Uh, many people assume that if you use redwood or cedar, that you have a nat uh, that you have a naturally durable wood, and that it does not need to be preserved or treated uh, when used on the exterior or in wet conditions. Just because you're using redwood or cedar, that does not automatically make that piece of wood naturally durable. The definition of naturally durable in the IRC states that in order to be considered naturally durable, 90% or more of the width of each side is required to be uh, from the heartwood of the tree. The heartwood is the inner part of the tree and it's generally darker than the sapwood. The definition goes on to call out other species of wood which are also decay or termite resistant uh, besides the redwood and cedar. Any wood that requires decay resistance because of the use or location, which is typically exterior or wet conditions, is required to either be preservative treated or naturally durable. One thing to note when applying this requirement to exterior decks, porches, balconies, and similar structures, there is a geographical exception in the IRC. This states that wood used on decks, porches, balconies, and similar appurtenances does not have to be preservative treated or naturally durable when in a geographical location, which is not historically subject to decay or termites. So if you are located in a dry, arid climate uh, where the building official approves it, of course, uh, these requirements do not apply. So any wood could be used, even wood uh, with more than 90% of the sap wood of redwood or cedars. So does AWC have any free online calculators? Yes, we do. If you visit uh, our website, awc.org, right at the top of the page, you can click on tab uh, for calculators. From there, you can find our free uh, span calculator for joists and rafters and a connection calculator. Uh, both of those can be used directly from the website. And then we have several other uh, calculators on that page, which would require a download from, from the App Store. But all of those are, or, uh, yeah, all the ones uh, listed on there are free. Before we ask any questions here, uh, just keep in mind uh, that this class was developed from frequently asked questions that we get from code officials across the country. AWC does have a FAQ section on the website, which we try to update often with new things that we get questioned on. If you run into an issue or if you have a question, please reach out to your local regional manager or use AWC's help desk to submit your questions. We may add your question to our FAQ page, which will then help out other code officials. We try to bring you information that is useful and relevant to you so that you can apply it and use it every day. If you have topics or ideas for future webinars, e-courses, or other training, also please let us know. In addition, I'll put out a, a quick plug for our field staff. Uh, we come out to provide free training and resources to code officials. We provide training at state conferences, regional training institutes, chapter conferences, monthly meetings, or pretty much any other time a, a group of code officials are getting together. If you need us at all, please reach out to, an, uh, to AWC. We can set up a time to come out and do live or virtual training uh, to any part of the country on a number of wood code related topics. And so with that, I will, uh, end the presentation and we can take any live uh, questions from the audience now. All right. Well, thanks for that presentation, Edge. So we've had a handful of questions. Well, we've had more than a handful of questions come in, but we'll probably only have time for a handful uh, since we're approaching the half hour. So we'll get right into it. The first one was related to your question, uh, the slide you had discussing knee bracing for interior posts for decks in DCA6. Uh, and, and the question, I guess it's uh, asking for a little clarification. If we had knee bracing on both sides of an, an interior post uh, on, on a deck, if we have you know, multiple interior posts and have knee braces on both sides, would that be acceptable or is that still a no-no? Yeah, it kind of depends on how you're how you're applying it. So um, if you're if you're using the DCA six, that that you would still not be able to use that, um, uh, just because the DCA six those, those it's a prescriptive guide, and that was that was developed, you know, with without those uh, knee braces in, on those center posts, um, and so they were you know kind of the the posts were pretty much maxed out uh, in, in the design capacity. 
Um, but if you if you do run into a situation where somebody put knee braces on there, um, or they just want them, I, I, I've heard it before, where they, they want it just for aesthetics, you could still go back and, and get that engineered uh, through engineering analysis and um, uh, try to uh, try to justify it that way to make sure that those that those posts can still uh, sustain those loads. Right on. All right. Uh, let's see. Next question. Uh, oh, I can answer this one. Uh, when is the next edition of the NDS going to be released? And that is scheduled for release in 2024. Uh, and then, all right, here we've got another question um, related to DCA-6. Uh, can code officials make copies of the DCA-6 to share with contractors? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a free document. Uh, the more, I guess, the more that it's, it's getting shared and getting used out there, the, the better. Um, you know, we, we do provide it for free on the, on the website. So, um, you know, you can also just direct uh, contractors to the website. Uh, that way, if they prefer the, the English version or the Spanish version, they can they can get whichever whichever one they prefer. But um, yeah, if you'd like to provide that to contractors, I, I think we'd be we'd be all for that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and we we do encourage folks to ensure they have the most up to date copy of the stand or of the document if they're going to be sharing it as well. I, I was just going to mention that that yeah, if if you okay. do go to the website, then at least you know you're getting the the most recent version. Absolutely. Um, here's a question related to live loads on decks. Uh, the, there was a question, um, on DCA-6, we have live loads of 40 PSF listed, and I think there's some confusion as to whether or not the live loads on decks per the IRC are 40 PSF or 60 PSF. So could you comment on that a little bit, Ed? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, in the IRC, uh, yeah, it's table R301.5 uh, that does have the uh, minimum uniformly distributed live loads, and uh, there there is a space there for for balconies and decks, and that that is 40, 40 psf. Um, where some of the confusion may come in is is the IBC uh, also says forty pounds for uh, for residential areas, but then if you go into uh, 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 balconies and decks, they have a separate section in there for balconies and decks, and that says one point five times the uh, floor load. And so if you're using the, the IBC, uh, that would actually end up being 60 pounds per square foot then. Um, and that, that, that could come into play uh, residentially wise where you have you know an, anything three units or more. So apartment buildings or dormitories, hotels, um, th those types of uses, uh, which are still residential, but would fall under the IBC. That, that's where um, 60 pounds per square foot would come in. But again, that, that DCA six guide, um, that is just used for uh, for one and two family residential, uh, so you are limited to to forty pounds per square foot uh, for the for to, if you're going to use that DCA six. All right, uh, here's a question on fastenings, and I think this will probably be the last one we've got time for before we close things out today. Um, but we talked about staggering fasteners to prevent splitting and making sure that they're not all in a line. Um, and the question is: is do does NDS or SPIDWIS or any of our standards prescribe a minimum amount of stagger or, or any sort of minimum or maximum amount of stagger uh, to to accommodate the the intention of not splitting the wood? Yeah, there's there's nothing in the actual uh, code text or standard text that I, that I'm aware of. Um, but if you go into the SPIDWIS commentary, uh, it, it does state that. That even as little as as an eighth of an inch would would meet the intent of of staggering. So um, you know, while while we don't put a minimum in there, just, even just a just a little bit of that stagger, uh, just so that they're not perfectly in line, is is really going to do the trick and and help out to uh, to avoid splitting of the of the framing member. Great. All right. And this one, um, I know that I said that was going to be our last question, but I'm <laughs> I'm obviously being dishonest. Uh, one last question. Does the updated uh, diaphragm, do the updated diaphragm tables in the new version of SPIDWIS include values for roof sheathing ring shank nails? Uh, no, uh, so those, those still just, just call out uh, common or, or galvanized box nails um, in, the, uh, in those, those tables for now. 
First question is, when we have a single shear connection, how do we know which member is the main member and which member is the side member? Sure, thanks, Lori. All right, uh, yeah, so side member versus uh, main member. Um, basically, the, the main member is, is what you're going into and the side member is what, what's getting attached to it. So um, uh, kind of an easy way to kind of think about that is the side member is what, what the, the head of the fastener is going to be uh, resting up against, whereas the main member is, is what the, the tip of the fastener is going to be going into. Um, there are some situations, you know, if you have double shears, so if you've got like a through bolt with, uh, you know, one, one piece of wood in the middle and, and two pieces of wood on, on either side of it with a through bolt all the way through, then that main member is the, it's the center member at that point. Um, and, uh, uh, and then also, uh, if you do have just two pieces with, with a through bolt where you don't really have a, you know, a, a head on one side and a, and a tip going into another member, uh, probably the best way there is, is check it both ways. Um, you know, check with, with, one member being the main and the other one being the side and then and then reverse it and check the engineering the other way just to see which which one is is more critical excellent uh, another fastener question so in some of the illustrations we have um, i think there were some questions on the actual dimensions of the fasteners um, and where in the NDS would those be found? You know, bearing in mind that the NDS, we've got our standardized fasteners and then we've got, you know, plenty of uh, proprietary fasteners out there. So where would folks want to look if they're looking for fastener dimensions? Yeah, and that's a great question. Again, yeah, I, I can show you where, where it is uh, if, you're, if you're referring to the NDS. But again, if you have, like you mentioned, if you have a proprietary fastener, if you have something that's new, um, you know, you're probably going to look at the the uh, ESR 1539 from iSanta or or uh, uh, the manufacturer specifications on some of that stuff. But as long as I'm sharing my screen here, uh, I'll show you the the NDS real quick. Um, if you haven't been out to our website, uh, we we did update it last year, so that this may look a little bit different to you. But it's uh, awc.org. Um, just just because you know I've got uh, you know a bunch of people on here. I'll show you kind of what's what's in here real quick, but uh, as you scroll down, you've got uh, some of our free tools and calculators. Uh, all of our uh, uh, e-courses are on here. Some of our FAQs, some news, um, information on our next upcoming webinar and a few other topics. Way down here at the bottom, if you are a, a code official that's out there, definitely sign up for our code official connection and uh, get to stay on top of some of the, the you know latest wood news that, that's relevant to uh, building and fire officials that are out there. But if you are looking for any of our standards, um, there, there's kind of two ways of getting there. You can you can come right up top here to standards and, and click on that. And that's going to take you to everything. Also, if you're on the main page, uh, you can see the menu button up here in the upper right hand corner. And then you can go to the resource hub and then codes and standards. So uh, here you can find the NDS, the NDS supplement, uh, both the 2018, 2015, wood frame construction manual, the SPIDWIS, the special design provisions for wind and seismic, uh, permanent wood foundations, our, our latest uh, specification, the fire design specification, 2022 version, uh, that's gonna deal with, uh, uh, with, with fire properties of wood, uh, some older commentaries and, and some of our archives. But again, we're looking at the NDS here. So we can click on that. You can purchase copy, uh, purchase hardcover, or you can also, uh, view it all for free uh, and you can jump right to any of the chapters so uh, you'll want to look down here at appendix and appendix L and I already have it called up here and, and kind of uh, uh, honed in right to appendix L uh, so here you have uh, you know standard hex bolts and again nice, nice quick and easy uh, table here that that's going to give you uh, the diameter and based off that diameter you can get all the other values uh, for uh, um, again for a standard hex bolt Next page of uh, leg screws. Uh, next page you have uh, standard wood screws, box common and uh, sinker or steel wire nails. And here's where actually, you know, you can kind of take a look at this and you can uh, look at a, at a 10 penny common nail, you know, which is three inches long, a D, which is the, the shaft diameter of uh, 0.148 and then a head diameter of 0.312. And you can start to see the difference then between a common nail, a box nail, and a sinker. Um, 
you know, where, you know, the, the box nail is a little bit smaller of a shaft. Uh, the sinker is even a little bit smaller of a shaft again, a little bit shorter and a little bit smaller of a head size. Um, you know, so if you if you do get a contractor that's out there saying, hey, yeah, I know I've got box nails, common nails were called out, they're the same thing. Well, you can call them out and say, no, actually, you're, you're a little bit wrong here. Uh, keep going through uh, Appendix L, you also have uh, some ring shank nails that are that are in there as well. And then it ends up with uh, with some standard washer sizes. So all that information's in there under Appendix L. Again, it's it's all free. Um, you can you can search through that information pretty quickly on our website. And again, if you haven't been out to the website in a while, I would definitely encourage you to go out there and uh, explore around a little bit and see what other resources are out there. All right, thank you so much, Ed. And I'm going to hog the last question uh, for myself today. The question was, when's the next edition of the NDS due to be released? And I can inform you all that we are hard at work on the 2024 edition, and you should be seeing it uh, in time to be referenced in the next version of the IBC. Excellent. All right, I think Marcy, if you wanna go ahead and take it back and close us out. I do indeed. So very quickly, thank you, Ed. And this concludes the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education System. Have a great day.